Hello everyone, how are you guys doing out there? Hope you all had a good weekend again and hope everything is going well for each of you. So today is going to be a little bit different. Um, first of all, if you can, just let me know how the audio is, is coming in for you guys. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'll just be going over a few things and then I'm going to have Chris Marcus come on and, and we'll be doing a live interview with him. Chris Marcus from Arcadia Economics and the author of a pretty darn good book, uh, The Big Silver Short. So hopefully you, you guys will take a look at that, that book, but we'll be going over a few things. Um, and then afterwards, if, if we have time, if it's not too late, then we'll go over the rest of the things that, that you see scrolling on the screen here. But uh, first thing, you know, as I said, we're just going to go over a couple stuff and then we'll bring Chris Marcus on. And um, if you have questions for him, just put it out here and um, we'll try and sneak a few of them in. So hang tight, sit back, relax. I'll get a few things ready. There probably will be a few difficulties along the way but we'll we'll get through them so glad y'all could could make it out here charles breed seymour rivers qd timothy max saul goodman glad you folks all could make it out so we'll go ahead and get things ready and i'll see you guys in just a bit Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira, and this is our weekly live stream, where, as I mentioned, we're going to change things up this time around. We're going to be bringing on Chris Marcus in just a bit, and um, we're going to ask a bunch of questions, um, ask him a few things, and we'll be sure and try and slide in some of your questions for him as, as well. So we do appreciate you being here. Uh, Saul Goodman, always be funding, Fat Vegan, Carrie Ellen Wilder. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the um, audio checks. Appreciate it a lot. So again, if this is your first time to our channel or you haven't already done so, please do subscribe. Hit the bell to be notified of new updates and give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we really do appreciate your support and we thank you for it. You can always find us on social media. Our website is silverbullying.com.sg where we specialize in systemic wealth protection. Um, Sure, you can get silver and gold from us, yes, but I think you're going to find that a lot of what we do, our products and services, we do specialize in systemic wealth protection. So if that's one of the things on your mind where you understand what's going on and you're looking for ways to, to preserve your wealth, store your wealth, that's what we do. So give us a call or contact us. Facebook, Silver Bullion SG. Twitter, Silver Bullion PL. Audio versions can be found on bit.ly, bit.ly slash sbtv itunes or slash sbtv spotify and do join do join our crisis tracker group because that's where we go over a lot of um things uh just about every day we'll put posts or um news articles as they pertain to financial news economics gold and silver and things like that so i do hope that uh we'll see you on that crisis tracker group upcoming guest this time is going to be kevin smith Kevin Smith from Crest Cat. Process. So I do hope that, again, you'll subscribe and hit the bell to be notified so you'll know when uh, Kevin Smith's interview comes up. So if you guys, Magic Man, yes, we're going to be having Chris Chris on in a bit. So if you have questions, let us know, and we'll try and slide those in. Uh, let's see. The letter Y, absolutely, silver and gold prices are all over the place, um, without a doubt. Uh, let's see. Fat Vegan, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, the major banks in China stop civilians from buying gold and silver. How does this affect us markets? You know what? Let's 
let's bring that question up to Chris Marcus as well. I did see that article where um, uh, the banks in, I believe it's the banks in China, they're trying, trying to um, dissuade people from um, going into gold and silver for their own good. They're trying to um, persuade them to go into other things like their stock market and things like that. So we'll, um, we'll ask Chris Marcus about that. That's, that's a great, a great, great question. Appreciate that. Um, let's see what else is out here. Um, Conrad, thank you. Thank you as well. Uh, do you think the VA disability payments will be cut in the coming collapse? I definitely rely on those to live right now. Uh, question for both. Conrad, you know, I think that is something that they will not touch. Um, cause the thing is my opinion now, um, I, I did serve as well, but my opinion is when it comes to things like veterans and, and their their um their programs, they're almost like sacred. You do not touch those. You do not take away from those. Um, simply because, you know, you gotta put it this way: if you're serving right now, and you see that they cut back on on any type of VA benefit or anything like that, you are not going to be fully, um, fully all in with your commander in chief and with your government. So for that reason, I do not think they're going to touch anything to do with, with VA. Uh, that's, I think that's walking into very, very dangerous territory because you, you got to make sure your military is always, always protected. Um, they protect you. You need to protect them. It works both ways. So I don't think they're, they're going to touch that at all. If they did, um, I tell you what, that would be, um, you're going to have a lot of, People in the military are going to be upset, and that's something that that could potentially even damage or or hurt or really um, get the military pretty uh, upset. So I don't think they're going to touch that. I I, I think you you can feel a bit um be at ease, be at ease about it, be at ease. So again, glad you folks all could be here. Kevin Ware, Saul Goodman, again, Resolute Patriot, first time I've seen you here. Welcome aboard the Big Silver Short. Grateful. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get into that. We'll ask Chris about it as well. Um, so Kevin Smith, he's gonna be our guest coming up this week. Last week we had Silver Bullion founder and the Safe House founder Gregor Gregerson, and I just want to go over a couple clips from him, and then we'll move over and bring on Chris Marcus. So a couple clips from Gregor Gregerson from last week. Over the last three, four five decades, we've been increasing the amount of money there at a much faster pace than real productivity. And now this is spiking up to unprecedented levels. And so it's just a matter of time for somebody to say, I don't want to keep my wealth because that's what matters. It's your wealth. It's not your US dollar balance. It's your wealth. I don't want to keep my wealth in US dollars. I want to keep it in something else. But where do you keep it? If you put it into bonds, they're not paying any interest. And anyway, that's still US dollars because they're just promising you to give you back US dollars. Right? If you put it into equities, well, that's where everybody's putting some money now because in the stock market is making new highs when the real economy is down into doldrums, which all people are wondering why. Well, it's because they're printing so much money, it has to go somewhere, it's going to the stock market. Uh, which means the stock market is way overpriced. It's, it's probably the highest valuation probably ever compared to GDP. So again, that's a bad place. Um, maybe put it into real estate. But again, such so question of the real economy breaking down. So again, put it into gold and silver because you cannot print it. And... So that's a natural diversification into which you would want to go. Okay, so that was uh, Silver Bullion and Safe House founder Gregor Gregerson. And, and his question, where do you put your wealth? And, and it's, a, it's a very good question. He mentioned real estate. A lot of guys like real estate. Um, I, I do as well. And, and again, none of this is financial advice, professional or otherwise. All of us are just sharing our opinion. So a little bit of a disclaimer here. A lot of guys do like real estate as well. I, I do too. But the issue with, with real estate for me anyway is I don't find it to be very liquid where in a time of need where you really need to to get out of it and, and position yourself in something else, real estate can take a while. You know, it, it can.
take a while. So it, it's not quite as liquid as things like silver and gold, but still it, it's, it, it's a lot of people do like it none, nonetheless. So where do you put your wealth? And um, silver and gold, it, it is a, a natural thing to, to go ahead and look at as being stores of wealth to get you through transitions. We're definitely going to be going through a transition. And what I mean by that is uh, we're in a current monetary system right now, and it does look like we're going to transition over into a different type of monetary system and things like silver and gold. Probably some of the best vehicles to be in to get you from today to tomorrow as whatever new monetary system comes in. And this is one of the things we talk about when when we say we, we do specialize in wealth, systemic wealth protection. So Again, uh, just shoot us an email or, or give us a call and, and we can talk about these things anytime. Another uh, question that, another clip from Gregor Gregerson that I want to share with you. Uh, let me put this one on. So the market is 220 times, 230 times smaller than gold, which means that a lot less money needs to flow into silver for it to really start going up. And so the sort of say, say, uh, factors that you have to look in. Essentially, Silver has been forgotten, but once it becomes uh, more in the news and a little bit more acceptable as you know, as a thing to buy, you will see that price really go up very drastically. Yeah. And what should, people should realize is, it is so low, based on the example I gave before, that it has so much more potential of going much much higher, and a history of doing that. Is that at least in my opinion, it's not the time to sell. In my opinion, I've been adding more silver now, um, and uh, feel sorry I didn't buy more because I expect it to be going a lot higher from here on out. Yeah, I feel sorry I didn't buy more too. Oh, <laughs> the silver slingshot, though, a lot of us are expecting silver to really, really rear back and just shoot forward and part of that reason is because when we look at this this chart here on the far left where you see the peak that was when silver was at its highest back in 2011 or so just about at 50 bucks 50 dollars an ounce when you come to the far right you see that little yellow circle says we are here or you are here that's where we are we're less than 50 percent of silver's all-time high so silver does have a long way to go that's for sure and um i think we're gonna we're gonna see it move up okay so let's um move on a bit i can get one of these buttons to work here i think we're having a little bit of some difficulties right now but hey what's a live stream without running into difficulties right that always seems to seems to happen so yes we are stuck on this frame right now doesn't want to seem to to move um then it will give it a little bit of time so some let me take a look at some of your your comments uh rolf steiner central banks can really only blow bubbles and now the bubble party is just about over uh that is true i think they're running out of, of some options with without a doubt um Okay, for some reason this thing is still stuck. So let's just go through some comments and hopefully it'll it'll clear up a bit. Um, okay, let's see. New name which no one knows. Japan has kept it going. How long can our Fed keep it going? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think with the Fed, you know, I think it's because a lot of people they, you know, we we don't really understand. The, the true economics of it all or, or financials. And, you know, we, we run into this, this issue where we just kind of um, go with the flow. And, and I think now with the Fed, you know, pretty much giving helicopter money out, you know, PPP and things like that. I mean, it is needed. Relief is needed. Um, you know, it, it's going to be one thing that, again, will kind of blind people or not let them see what's what's going on you know as long as they have you know as we say here some rice in the rice bowl you know guys are going to be okay with with just about anything so you know we'll, we'll have to see what goes on with with that and we are a bit stuck here i'm having some a really big issue with this with this live stream right now um 
I hope I don't have to cut it and start over again. Um, just hang in there. Let me see if I can work through some things. Um, okay, so anyway, we're going to be bringing on Chris Marcus shortly. If I can get this thing to work. If not, I will restart the thing and just go straight to, to Chris Marcus. Um, sorry about that, guys. Uh, abstract fitness the government is fighting over who can give more free stuff uh, that is true i think we can just call that pandering for votes uh, elections coming up they're going to be trying to get as many votes as they can they're going to be giving people as much free stuff as they can to to get those votes and hey there we are oh we're back thank goodness okay so what we're going to do first is just take a look at the silver and gold price, and then we're going to move over and bring on Chris Marcus. Okay, so this thing is a little off here. Let me get that centered for you guys. Okay, so first thing, we'll head on over to our website. This is silverbullying.com.sg, and I just want to take a quick look at the silver price right now. 2426, you know, first thing I think it shot up this morning. And I think even Chris had a dream about that. He was telling me last night that uh he, he had a dream that silver was gonna shoot up and he did. So he was he was correct on that. Maybe I shouldn't have disturbed him last night and, and let him kept on sleeping and then uh maybe silver would have kept on going up. But silver twenty four twenty six, gold nineteen seventy six. So both of them kind of hanging in there to where they were on Friday. Again, our investor kit, it's free. Go ahead and download that and do sign up for our storage. That is free as well. Uh, there's no maintenance fees or anything like that to to hold an account open. Again, if you're concerned about all these things, you know, leading up to a, some type of systemic wealth event, you definitely do want to contact us. And silver gold ratio, we're at about 81.5. Not too bad. We were back in the 83 range, I think, and now we're back down to 81. I think last week we even were down mid 70s or high 70s so you know things are moving moving pretty quick and so with that i'm going to bring on chris marcus i'm going to give him a call on skype let me just open up my skype here so chris if you're if you're there uh get ready i'll be giving you a call soon and some of you guys said chris needs to change his music chris needs to change his music well i'm gonna give chris an introduction with his music i like his music anyway live interview with chris marcus coming up from arcadia economics the author of the recently released book the big silver short since leaving Wall Street, Chris has dedicated his financial career towards studying the situation and helping people understand what's actually happening, how to protect and grow your money, and how to turn what will be a crisis on Wall Street into an incredible source of opportunity for you and the people that you care about. So with that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to see if Skype will work and get Chris Marcus to, to join us. So let me give him a call. Hey, Chris. Hello there, Patrick. How you doing? How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Glad you can make it. I see you're in the vault today, huh? Yeah, yeah, we gotta <laughs> we gotta stay in the vault here, and uh, but it's a pleasure to have, to be on here with you today, Patrick. And uh, I think I'm almost set up and ready to go. All right. Well, we're glad you could you could make it by and and show us all your your silver that you have there. You're making me jealous. I need to go out and and get some more before that price starts to starts to move again. So again, Chris, welcome. Glad glad you could make it. We did have one question. Um, it. One question came in was asking about uh, if you think we're ever going to see uh, the premiums come back below ten percent. I'm, I'm I'm not sure if the, if that person was talking about silver or or gold, but premiums are quite high. Do you think premiums will will come back down? Um, I'm not expecting that anytime in the near future. Uh, I did an interview with a bullion dealer uh, a couple days ago where he's been mentioning wholesale premiums have been going up and the silver supply chain getting a little bit fragile again. 
we saw those uh, announcements from the U.S. Mint. And um, so, I mean, I, I factor in, we're, we're talking about the most manipulated market possible. So I, would, I think it's useful to expect the unexpected. Yeah. Um, but with that said, uh, in fact, I could see a case, uh, actually James Anderson of SD Bullion the other day was mentioning um, that he sees the uh, shortage of uh, American Silver Eagles coming. And when you look at the factors out there, um, I would think it's more likely to see the premiums go up in the near future than down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, before we start, let me back up a bit though. Chris, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your YouTube channel, Arcadia Economics? And I, I personally like your song. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Michael. Uh, well, it is part of actually a, a whole album that, you know, a lot of this began back in 2009 after the housing bubble collapsed. I'd come out of Wharton Business School, was working on a trading floor, and found it odd how I was theoretically the guy trained to see things like that. And that was what led me to start reading Peter Schiff. And all these guys who had seen it in advance were talking about gold and silver, um, then certainly living through 2011. Um, that was uh, what made me start thinking that there was something not quite right about these markets. Uh, left Wall Street in 2012 to focus on gold and silver. Um, and then the last couple of years really built up the YouTube channel where it's been a lot of fun digging into this, uh, putting the book out, especially now as it seems like many of these things are beginning to finally play out. And uh, one last note I would mention you know, I know a lot of people in the gold and silver community have been taking a lot of crap for years and saying, well, one day, watch out, the printing is all going to come back. Maybe silver, we have a little longer to wait. But for all the people who have been talking about gold, I mean, it's, it's all happened so quickly. But here we are. We're not talking about one day anymore. Gold is in new record territory. Uh, it looks like it keeps getting close to $2,000. And then it appears something that resembles not my definition, but Bart Chilton's definition of a spoof mysteriously yeah. happens, and we can dig into that today. But, um, yeah, it's been the uh, most fascinating thing I ever imagined I would find in my financial career. Okay, okay. And you recently wrote that book, The Big Silver Short. Can you tell us about your book, The Big Silver Short, and what prompted you to go ahead and, and write this book. And of course, what's it, what's it about? Well, it's about gold and silver markets and why the price action seems so bizarre so often where, you know, you have exponentially more money printing and debt than 1980, let alone even 2011. Um, and again, really how this started was I've been trading equity options and then got into gold and silver. So by the time Ben Printem up Bernanke, or helicopter <laughs> Ben, as he likes to refer to himself, um, well, I remember getting a note in our morning trader notes that he was gonna launch QE2. And fortunately, by then I was ready, um, had a lot of option positions on GLD and SLD, and at least on the way up, thought I might be home free financially then. and. Yeah. Partly, when you look at what was happening, U.S. getting downgraded, um, QE2, I mean, this, I still wonder <clears throat> if we weren't close to seeing this thing go, the dollar go off the tracks back in 2011, yeah. and were it not simply for the gold and silver prices being hammered, perhaps what we're starting to see now may have been happening back then, but especially... Uh, you know, A, seeing how silver just got clobbered in the middle of a Sunday night at the end of April 2011, opens up $6 lower when, you know, again, we've just had more printing since then. And especially what really made me start questioning whether the market was clean again, yeah. you know, I wasn't, uh, you know, a pharmacist. I was trading equity options. So I, I had a background in markets and especially when gold hit 1900 at Labor Day weekend of 2011. I actually remember it clear as day because I get this email alert that the Swiss had just pegged their franc to the euro. 
Again, U.S. had just been downgraded, so it's you know, people were talking about the Swiss franc as the last safe haven when they say they're going to peg to the euro, which was being printed, meaning the Swiss are going to start printing, so they don't make sure their currency is devalued as much as the other ones. Yeah. I thought gold might be about to shoot through $2,000. Then instead, about a half hour later, it drops $60. In the middle of the night, when the liquidity is thinnest, uh, and I would have been thrown out of my trading shop that afternoon if I ever executed an order. You, we were specifically trained never, because if you want the best price, you don't just hammer a big offer, drive the price yeah. down. And that was what led me to start uh, reading Ted Butler and, and noticing there's, there's something unusual here. And essentially, a couple of years later, when I started doing the book, it was almost an attempt to disprove or see if I was missing something, because the way I saw it is that if natural demand was driving silver to 50, and the only reason it came down was because banks sold paper contracts that they don't have the metal to deliver, if that is the case, then to me it seemed like $50 would be a floor of whatever the real true value is. And, uh, you know, it was nice, uh, all these folks uh, and shows that I watched like yours for years and, and studied, really getting a chance to, I mean, I like to think I could have done an intelligent book on my own, but to do an interview style format, which is patterned after Jack Schwager's Market Wizard series, but also incorporating all of these experts where, you know, silver is really like a great team sport because you have all these people that have decades of insight and know different stories and have had different conversations. And I came away more convinced than ever of my, conclusions. Uh, obviously, the book lays it out so people can hear and, and see the different things for themselves, but that's where it came from. And again, it seems like it is happening now. Okay. Yeah. I have to agree completely with just about everything you said. You mentioned um, Bart Chilton and you had an interview with him. I believe it was the last one he ever gave before he passed on. Uh, mm -hmm. For the benefit of our guests, who was Bart Childen and what were the things he said that stood out in your interview with him? <clears throat> well, Bart Chilton was the former CFTC commissioner, one of them that presided over their, uh, I guess they had a couple investigations into silver manipulation. Interestingly, formally they announced they never found anything. Um, we know that is an invalid conclusion, not my opinion, but as many folks know, the Department of Justice is getting guilty confessions from several former J.P. Morgan and Bear Stearns traders that I might add wasn't – they all had that same clause that was done with knowledge of the supervisors, widespread practice at the firm, so not just some rogue junior-level trader. Um, and Bart confirmed that. In fact, you know, I know there's a lot of people who say, you know, they're tired of hearing about silver being manipulated, banks doing this and that. And I can understand that. Um, again, you know, I mean, I, the trading floor helped me see the difference between what I want and think is fair and what's going to happen. And um, but it was interesting because a lot of the things that folks like Ted Butler or Gatta or then later on myself and others have thought were happening, Bart flat out came out and confirmed. Um, there were a few shockers, and it's it's funny, I, I still watched it, parts of it back from time to time. I love looking at my face, seeing, because there were a couple times where it was like five minutes in, and he started saying some things where my head's about to explode. I'm like, whoa, what did he just say? And I'm just trying to like just sit there, just keep your mouth shut, let him keep talking um i guess first uh, funny one was i was saying you know doesn't this set up a situation where there's a lot more paper silver than can ever be delivered and his answer was well that's the case in all of the commodities markets wow. which <laughs> doesn't you know uh but then uh there's another as it continues on he says well i would never come out and name a bank that was short 40 percent of the silver market but the record show it was J.P. Morgan. So it was kind of funny the way he phrased it. But then he confirms J.P. Morgan took over Bear Stearns' position. 
The combined position was so large, it was over the position limits a trader was allowed to hold. He gave them a temporary waiver to reduce it. You didn't remember if it was three, six, or nine months, but not years, and somewhere in that range. And he was furious because he found out a couple months later they show up, and rather than reducing it, they had made it bigger. And what was really, uh, and it kind of came out through the book when I got some of the other people's accounts, which was stunning to me because... At the exact time, he's confirming Bart Chil uh, that J.P. Morgan had a position that was over the size limit, and they made it bigger rather than smaller. This is exactly when the price of silver in 2008 plummets from $21 to 9 in the midst of the exact conditions that anybody watching this, I mean, Patrick, you're qualified expert. What, what are the reasons that you hear most often? What are the reasons people buy physical silver? Mostly they buy it because they don't have faith in the dollar. They think the dollar is going to go down. They want some type of wealth protection. Right. So think about what was happening. We had subprime start in 2007. Fed starts cutting interest rates um, September of 2007. It was at five and a quarter. And prior to the collapse of Bear Stearns, they had cut interest rates to 3%. And for folks who, to put that in perspective, that's 225 basis points is how it would be measured. So in the span of six months, they cut interest rates, 225 basis points, which was the total amount they were able to raise interest rates over the next 10 years. Because after QE1, QE2, and the Fed kept talking about tightening, they went from a quarter to two and a half. And then the, the whole economy started melting down in 2018, yeah. so they started lowering rates again. Um, so that was a big, big cut. And during that period, silver somewhat predictably rises from $13 to $21. Then you have this deal where Bear Stearns fails, and it wasn't, it wasn't you know, a little while after or shortly after. Within days, I think it was two days, price of silver is at $21. It starts dropping as, at that point, the largest investment bank ever to fail. So we have systemic risk. And if people just think back to 2008 for a second, how worried and scared people were. Yeah. Um, so you have the Fed doing massive interest rate cuts, banks failing, yet somehow silver just starts dropping. At the same time, Bart Chilton confirms J.P. Morgan's making their position bigger. And in case someone, you know, in case you're not convinced yet, to me what was the smoking gun is that by the time silver hits $9, after Lehman fails, so Lehman Brothers' next new largest investment bank to fail, Silver plummets, and there's but there's a shortage of metal. Yeah. Some of the dealers thought they were actually going to go out of business because they couldn't source product. U.S. mints offline, Canadian mints offline, Europe's offline. Finally, I think it was November of 2008. Comex says nine dollars, and the U.S. mint is calling bullion dealers saying, "All right, we'll give you a Silver Eagle for 17.50, and that's before your markup." Um, so, there, I mean, there was a lot that Bart said, but, I mean, that was really the stunning takeaway. Yeah. And what I think is something that, you know, really until Bart said that, it was, I don't know that anyone could have known, but when you, the importance of that is that even in the gold and silver community, you hear all the time that, you know, gold fell from 1,000 to 700, silver fell from 21 to 9 because of panic selling, but... Now we know that's not the case. This was because banks sold paper, gold, and silver that they didn't own, and you can drive down the price. That's not rocket science. It's, I, I, I think, a uh, felony and uh, certainly against anything I've ever studied or would have even thought to do in my days as a trader. Um, and again, we don't have to take my, by all means, don't take my opinion for any of this. You can hear Bart or you can go read the confessions of these traders who now pled guilty, and um, why the CFTC still has no comment after Bart's interview or the, the Department of Justice comments. Uh, 
you know, we'll leave people to decide for themselves. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty, pretty interesting. I mean, do you think maybe Bart Chilton was just trying to come clean or, or what do you think was his motivation to to really open up with you and, and just tell you things exactly as, as they were? Well, it's a great question. I know a lot of people have wondered that. Um, I don't personally feel that it was a deathbed confession or attempt to come clean at all. Um, one of the reasons, if you actually look where, uh, you, know, you can Google it and find it on YouTube, there is a comment when I originally posted the interview with the name Sherry Chilton, which was his wife. I've never spoken to her directly, so I can't confirm that that was actually her, although it seemed genuine and, and the, the comment describes, says clearly she was offended by that, that people thought that and that he did not know of his condition at the time and that, you know, through their entire marriage, the, this issue was one of the things that kept him up the most. And even before I had seen that comment, though, uh, when I talked with him, you know, it was funny. Uh, I wonder if anybody else ever thought to ask him. Good point. Because I remember even as I was thinking about the people I wanted to interview for the book, his name popped into my mind and you know how we talk ourselves out of things. I'm like, Oh, he won't say yes. Or if he comes on, he's not going to say anything. And <clears throat> fortunately I've gotten used to just ask the question and see. And when he came on before the interview began, during the interview and after the interview, I mean, it was nothing but encouraging. And the impression I got was that he felt proud of what he had done. I think he wished that he could have done more. I don't think he was confessing anything. He was saying, I, I really wish you best of luck on success with the book. He invited me to come on his show, Boom Bust, after the book was out. Um, and he even, I think it was even during the interview, he said, I feel this is important. It should be out here. He was thanking me for doing it, which I'm like, you know, I, so... I know there are some people that think, you know, this or that, or that he should have done more. And to that, I would say it's, I find it's helpful to keep in mind the perspective or the world people are living in where, you know, I've worked on a trading floor and studied Austrian economics and gone down the rabbit hole, you know, and so I have one perspective. Bart, he was a, a government employee for most of his career. So... You know, my guess is I don't think that a lot of the things, you know, that your listeners and, and you and I talk about now about the extent of, you know, the, I don't know that he was sitting there thinking the Fed is the problem that a lot of us do, because I just think that wasn't the perspective he was coming from. And I felt that he, in his eyes, did, had done what he could help me because he wanted to do more. He. He actually had Andrew McGuire on his show about two months before I talked with him, where he mentioned some of these things as well. So um, that was the impression that I got from Bart. <clears throat> okay, yeah, that was a that was a very good interview, by the way. I mean, it's it was kind of um you wonder, you know, where is all this coming from? You know, all of these things just starting to spill over, but um. We're glad that he he did uh, bring it up, and we're glad that it was it was with you. You did a great job on on that interview, um, Chris. Got to ask you though, what's going on with silver? I mean, we we had a nice run of the other week. I think we even hit twenty six dollars an ounce, and then almost immediately we seen a drop back into the the twenty three dollar range. In your opinion, what's what's going on with it? Well, I I like that you mentioned my dream last night. It was funny. Uh... <laughs> I, I apparently not still learning to convert time zones. So I thought 9 a.m. we were going to talk and I wake up. I I was actually dreaming about the silver price. Uh, you know, it's funny when you spend so much time, it's like now even I'll wake up in the middle of the night, I'll be thinking about a landing page or silver, this and that. So it's quite on my mind. And uh, we actually did see quite a spike up right on the open today. Yes. And then again, we saw that interest pattern. I mean, what is silver down? I don't know, maybe 20 cents or something now. I think if silver just drifted down 20 cents, you know, that might seem normal. But to see it spike up 
and then get clobbered. And part of the reason why I have such a particular focus on that, one of the other things that Bart mentioned, um, I guess, which was the other biggest takeaway, is that I asked him if my understanding of what happened was correct in that, let's say, silver's at $20.03. You know, you start selling a little bit, you, you know, put a little pressure, then you, you, get, you start kicking the stop orders, the high-frequency trading algorithms, and then the thing plummets, these, 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 where it looks like it drops off a cliff on the chart, yeah. and then the same bank is always reportedly buying back lower, and it was, I mean, it, I, I love the answer he gave because I said, is that a good portrayal? And he says, well, that's a good, actually, that's a really good portrayal. And then he talks about spoofing for a couple of minutes before finishing saying, the only difference between what you said and how it actually happens is that now in today's markets, because of the way they're set up, when banks spoof, the moves are much larger. Yeah. Another data point on that, which uh, was one of the things that really started me on this path early on, you can, uh, and maybe I can put it in the uh, chat link uh, because I have it pulled up here. There's, uh, I'm sure folks, uh, many of you are familiar with Andrew McGuire, who contacted Elliot Ramirez of the CFTC in 2010, he was one of their guys, and Andrew basically said, the markets are rigged. Um, oh, get that in the chat window in a second. And he also walked um, Elliot through an example that is just posted in the chat there. And he mentioned how prior to a uh, labor announcement, he said there's going to be two things happen. If the price is, if the, the announcement is bearish for gold and silver, We'll just see it drop straight down. But if the news is perceived as good for gold and silver, you'll see it go up a little bit. So they get people on board and then hammer it down, yeah. which ironically is the same thing we saw tonight. It's the same thing we saw last Wednesday during the Fed meeting. It's the same thing that Bart Chilton described. And it's the same thing that these guys are pleading guilty to in confessions to the Department of Justice. Perhaps the only thing I don't get is that they continue to do it as they're being arrested, which is uh, made me wonder a lot, you know, is this investigation another, you know, thing to just appease people but really not do anything? I had kind of given up hope on it, although Andrew McGuire, again, who is a whistleblower for the Department of Justice and is far closer to the case than I am, I know he thinks that it is legitimate and that they are doing something. He thought the reason J.P. Morgan delivered 30 million ounces of silver on the mm -hmm. first notice day in the July contract was because that was part of a settlement and a negotiation with the Department of Justice to get back in the position limits. Um, so I'll defer to him on that. Um, but I mean, in either case, what is odd is that you see the same crime uh, happen and I know people are being affected by it. And uh, hopefully, uh, I guess the, the good news is that there's a lot to suggest that we're a lot closer to the end than the beginning. Okay. Hey Chris, got a got a comment here. Um, hang on, let me pull it up. Um, it was actually some one of the guys were asking if you could. Uh, there it is. Get Max Kaiser on if if you can. <laughs> a lot of Max Kaiser fans, I guess. So he's he's asking if you could get Max Kaiser on your program if you could. I I actually tried to get Max Kaiser in the book. Um, I reached out to him a couple of times, have not heard back. I would love to talk with him. In fact, it was interesting. Someone sent me a tweet of his the other day that, again, we just <laughs> remember in the gold market, you know, uh, we keep seeing each delivery month new records. And we saw another new record on the first day notice for the August deliveries. And uh, Max had a tweet saying that, I think at this point, it, it, he was saying that it clears that would clear out the inventory of gold and banks would be forced to go out and buy back gold. 
Um, I have not verified that yet, but along those lines, something that was quite interesting that I noticed yesterday, uh, Ted Butler, that I'm sure a lot of folks know, uh, has done a great deal of uh, invaluable research in this. And uh, he pointed out yesterday, which I thought was stunning, that for basically the last 10 years, normally what we would see happen is as the price goes up, the banks start getting short. Yeah. And there's actually, I will send this one over. Here's a great, um, great website where you can actually see a chart of the price as well as how long or short the banks are. And really until uh, last summer, when the banks were short, you could count on the price coming down and then you'd see them get flat, maybe a little bit long. And that's when a rally would begin. Um, but what's been different this time is that we saw these, these rallies in gold and silver over the last two weeks. And normally the banks would be getting shorter, but at least according to the COT data, they finally bought, they're buying back their shorts at a higher price now which to me, I mean, we've heard Bank of Nova Scotia pulling out um, a lot of anecdotal things. You know, that Reuters article suggesting that the banks are getting a little nervous about that, those short positions. Uh, I guess I hear in conversations things unofficially that also lead me to believe that's the case. And gee, you would think at this point also with the way people are piling into gold and silver and despite multi-trillion dollar stimulus packages already. Um, I, I mean, that's a ballsy thing to be short gold and silver to me right yeah. now. Um, that COT report shows the four largest traders in the silver market are short 248 million ounces of silver, which means that when it went up $4 from 20 to 24, that those four presumably banks lost about a billion dollars. So, um, and I would say, why are we seeing, you know, silver used to move 10, 20 cents a day. And now in, in the yeah. three and a half hours since it's been open, it went up 50 cents and then down almost a dollar from there. So I get it. You know, some people just want to hear when silver is exponentially higher. But I mean, you know, that's the thing with trading. Once silver is higher, you know, but when you look at the clues, and essentially how I've approached this was thinking about similar to Enron, where imagine if you knew Enron or Bernie Madoff was a Ponzi scheme and you didn't know when it was going to end. But if you were looking at it forensically and saying, all right, well, they stopped paying their distributors or this is behind the account or whatever. And you look for the signs and, um, you know, there's certainly uh, the, the Enron scheme is on fire right now. We'll see how much longer it goes, but um, a lot of good signs that it's, you know, heading towards a positive direction. Okay. We got another uh, question for you or comment here uh, from Fat Vegan. He wants to know your opinion about China banks and they are stop, they're stopping buying silver and, and gold. So he wants to know your opinion on that. Have you heard anything from that? I think there was a Reuters article that came out about it? I did read that article. Um, <clears throat> I know you've had Craig Hemke on your show, who's one of my favorite analysts. Yeah. And he's pointed out, which I kind of heard through the years, that Reuters is kind of viewed as a mouthpiece for the banks. <laughs> I don't know. That seemed a little odd to me to see that China was saying that. Um, I don't know if I fully believe that that is accurate as the article suggested. I don't know. Um, again, there's, uh, you know, very little we know about China. I mean, they say they have, what, 2,000 tons of gold, and then you hear these reports of, you know, massive chunks going in. So, um, unfortunately, Patrick, the Chinese government has not called me with direct comment on that. Um, I find that hard to believe on the surface of it, which is not to say it's not possible to be true, but um, I would point out both uh, Russia since at least 2004, China since at least 2009, have been aware of GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, 
uh, Chris Powell and uh, Bill Murphy, two people that really, in my opinion, are, are I would say heroes is an appropriate word. And uh, China and Russia have both been studying them for over a decade. So I think they know darn well what's going on. And um, certainly their actions would suggest as much. Okay. Next question. I think we touched on this just a little bit, but I understand the U.S. Mint is somewhat tightening up the supply for gold and silver uh, bullion coins. What have you been hearing about the supply of silver? Well, again, I mean, <clears throat> I know it's not the easiest time with COVID, so I assume that that is factoring in to some degree. Um, gee, there sure is also a lot to suggest that there's not a lot of silver floating around. Um, these numbers of how much is reportedly going into SLV and the silver trust, they're getting so massive that I just keep talking to more and more people and I see First Majestic just uh, popped in the window from oh, Abstract Fitness, good to see you there. <laughs> I actually talked with Keith Newmeyer from First Majestic about a week and a half ago. And, and he's like, no, there's no way you're, they're adding the metal in. Andrew McGuire, who, <clears throat> again, is closer to that, um, says it's, it's, it's impossible. I don't know which would be more bullish for silver, if they're adding that much metal in or if they're being fraudulently lying about the data. Um, so, again, it sure, I mean, it seems for years like the numbers don't add up. But when you see this rush into metal, I think that has to be playing in somewhat with uh, the mint, the mint and their problems. I mean, we had Hunt, the Hunt brothers taking delivery, and I don't know, maybe there was some other groups in 1980, but 1980 or 2011, I don't think we ever saw anything like what we're seeing now, where they're actively draining the COMEX. They're uh, Either the data is completely fraudulent or the run on metals is happening now. And if I can repeat that, the run on metals, all this stuff where guys like me and you, Patrick, and others who said, you know, one day watch out, you know, there's all this 501 plus leverage and, you know, you can keep prices low as long as there's no demand. But now the demand is here. And now... I also think the secret's getting out. That was one of my intentions with the, uh, the putting the book out there where, you know, there's a lot of the information out there, but I wanted to lay it out in a clear way so that if somebody knew nothing about silver, you can read that and you'll know more about silver and the economy for that matter than anyone I worked on with wall, on wall street. Um, you know, and it's again, all those signs, I mean, now, do I rule out, could could they hammer some massive offer and maybe at some point we see silver back in the teens? You know, I never thought silver could go down to $11 and change earlier this year. So again, at least the way I approach my own investing is that to me, the, the ultimate outcome is, is pretty much decided, um, you know, but I, I, I expect to see the unexpected. If gold and silver is the last plug that allows the deep state and politicians to spend money with printed dollars. Yeah. You'd have to assume they'll throw the, the kitchen sink at it to keep this stuff in check. But, um, it seems like we're reaching a breaking point. Yeah. I hear you. You know, we've got some guys, um, they prefer to buy the dip They're They're going to go ahead and, and wait for that price to come down. And then we've, we've got other guys there saying, you know what, just, just go ahead and get it now while you can. I think both guys, both guys are right, you know, in in some sense. But what's your opinion on this? Should should a guy maybe perhaps wait to buy the dip, or should he just go ahead and pick up the metal while he can? Well, it's a great question. I've actually been thinking about that a lot lately. Um, I've been thinking about that a lot for the last ten years. You know, I guess the price of silver is a little. I mean, all of a sudden we're talking about twenty four dollars silver, where it's. It's like, when did that happen? You know, we used to say like silver is 16, $17 and now a little higher. Um, <clears throat> my, my thought is that, you know, if, uh, especially if you have income coming in on a regular basis and 
you know, you're buying regularly and there's one day that the price is smashed, you could place your order that day. I think that makes sense. Um, but I say this even as a former equity options trader, which is a short term activity in nature. I mean, we're, again, the whole thing with the silver market, why we have this opportunity, I know some people are frustrated, the manipulation and banks get away with it. But at the same time, that is what's creating. You're buying something that yeah. seems to be a fraction of what it's worth. So <clears throat> I think there's a lot to be said for simplifying things and not trying to outthink yourself. And I guess where I've come at, and by all means, it is not financial advice. I don't know everybody who's watching, can't speak to them specifically, but the way I look at it is that for the most part, I figure, all right, have money coming next month, buy some silver, buy some mining shares. I do options as well. And I'll sit there and leave it. And if we're really in a bigger rally, which I think we are, it's gonna work out great. To the degree, will I take some other amount of money that's probably a lot smaller percentage and maybe see what I can do just, I mean, if nothing else, if you approached it where you leave your core position and you just sit there and leave it and you're not trying to outsmart a manipulated market, I mean, I think to, you know, if you take a smaller amount and use that as a learning experience and say, all right, you know, what, what can I see? Can I read any clues? I think that's a great, I mean, this is a once in a lifetime chance to, and I think there's a lot, anything was, but especially trading, when you actually put something on and see how it goes and think through it and go through that process, I think that can be invaluable. But I myself limit that to a certain amount where, because it's like if you're taking your whole position and saying, well, we'll still ran up to $24. You know, I think it's going to pull back. Well, it might, but unless you're, unless you're the one, you're the one person in the planet I haven't found yet that knows when they're going to rig it and when it's going to get smashed. What if silver? Uh, I mean, we've seen the moves. What if it jumps up to twenty six dollars? Mm -hmm. Then you 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 find yourself with a very difficult decision. Well, do you buy back in then? And I would suggest, unless someone really has a good handle on when things are going to go up or down, if you do, and by all means, go for it. Yeah. Um, I don't claim to be able to do that. So, again, that's how I approach that. Okay, it's pretty good advice there. Um, I believe, I, I got to ask you about this, though. I think one of your wishes was to actually have an interview with Bernie Madoff. Why Bernie Madoff, and what questions would you want to ask him? Uh, well, I'm curious how you found out about that one. <laughs> I've, I've been wanting to do that. I didn't remember if I said anything publicly, but <clears throat> that would be darn fascinating. I think it's ironic or somewhat funny that Bernie Madoff on his way to jail said, if you want to see a real Ponzi scheme, look at the U.S. government, and he was darn <laughs> right. Um if anyone looks at the debt clock, I mean, I think the thing's on fire and it's smoking. It's moving so fast at this point. Um, another thing with Bernie Madoff, if I do get the chance to talk with him, and I am going to put in a request, because <clears throat> again, hey, you know, I didn't think Bart, and who knows, but yeah. it's interesting. JP Morgan was Bernie Madoff's sole banker. Yep. And my understanding is that on that type of deal, that's rather uncommon to have just, you know, it's usually a syndicate of different banks. Um, and for folks, uh, there's a book called J.P. Madoff <laughs> by Helen Chapman. It goes through about 200 pages of felonies that, you know, and uh, J.P. Morgan, I believe they're up to 30 or $35 billion worth of fines in recent years. So that was where that idea for the petition came from. Certainly, I mean, again, my understanding of certain things, if I had done where I was on a trading floor, I would have expected to be in jail the next day. I mean, it seems like there's enough to at least, I mean, the Department of Justice actually took the unusual step of calling J.P. Morgan's precious metals desk a criminal enterprise, which is, I'm told by legal experts, not common for them to say something like that. So, I mean, are we at the point now where at least 
it's reasonable to say, it, it, I mean, I think you can make the case of disbanding JP Morgan. I mean, if they want to throw that whopper out there of too big to fail, I mean, at some point, it's like saying the mafia is too big to fail and they're keeping yeah. our garbage system. I mean, but I mean, is it is there enough to say like they shouldn't be allowed to trade gold and silver? So we'll see. Yeah, that that's a good question. Hey, we got another uh, question from from one of the viewers. He's asking, um, what are the chances of Fidelity closing? Of Fidelity? Yes. I haven't th heard anything specific to Fidelity. Um, I don't know if there uh, if he wants to type in a comment if there's something in particular he's getting at. Um, I mean, if it's to the general point of our some point when all this kind of uh, comes to a head where there'll be some shops that, I mean, I, th I think a lot more of these shops were really close to failing in 2008. Yeah. Um, you know, on the other hand, uh, it seems like the Fed is going to print and uh, bail out. I hear they're considering another airline bailout. And um, I keep wondering if they're buying, if Fed's even buying ETFs now, how come they don't buy GLD <laughs> and SLB? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, which, who knows, maybe the Fed is the big SLB buyer. Wouldn't that be funny if that turned out to be the case? So um, I don't, I haven't heard anything specifically to Fidelity. Um, Although maybe one thing somewhat related to that that I've thought about is on my list of things to do, so I haven't done this yet, but to the degree of if you own stocks, getting some sort of stock certificate so you're not just, you know, uh, again, I hope we don't get to all these extremes. And uh, Patrick, I know you uh, mentioned earlier, if we still have time, you wanted to talk about is there a way this doesn't have to be the end of the world Armageddon situation that so many think? Yeah. Um, I don't think that's the case, but, you know, I think about it, you know, it's like, I don't know, if someone does flip the internet switch off, you know, if you have a brokerage account at J.P. Morgan or Citigroup, you have a number on a screen from an institution that is already a criminal. So, um, you know... I have this rule of thumb that if you do business with people who are trying to do good business and find good outcomes for everyone, things usually go better versus, you know, it's like SLV, the custodians, JP Morgan. So yeah. are people going to get the metal back? I don't know. Hopefully, uh, will JP Morgan rip them off on stick some big fee in or some, I just, when you know someone is, doing bad business, my school of thought is to steer clear from that. And uh, one thing would be if you have, especially if you have a big portfolio, just call up and it's, it's easy to do and say like, send me the certificate. So that way at least, you know, unless you have a personal broker, if you have like Sprott or something where they have a legal team or you have a broker, maybe that's a little better. Yeah. Um, but that would be one suggestion. <clears throat> I'll tell you what, Chris, that would be a, <clears throat> Pretty interesting if, if, as you said, maybe it's the Fed buying GLD SLV, and then maybe it's the Fed that'll want to take delivery. That that would be that would be pretty pretty uh, especially if they did that. I mean, the, the whole thing has gotten so wacky. I mean, it's uh, I, I, again, um, to be clear, I'm not saying that that is the case or I have any right, information right, right. that is, but um, I mean, it's like you just wonder what these guys have cooked up next and. I think a big part of it also, <clears throat> more important than the numbers or anything else, really is shifting the mindset. I know it's been a tough couple of years for people in the metals, especially the people who saw QE2. I'd say they made an intelligent trade and got cheated. Yeah. Um, but as much as you can shift that mindset to, well, all right, you know, it's not how I would run it, but what is the situation as it is at the present moment? And hey, if the thing is undervalued and you have you're able to add to your position at a good price. I might add that all these people I've interviewed, I know most of them go on your show as well. They say one after another, guys like Rick Rules and, and other really successful investors, most money they made in their career was when they saw something that was out of line, yeah. the price went against them, and but they 
again, it comes with doing your homework. So, I mean, that's an important step, but if you come to the conclusion where, hey, this is out of line and you keep buying more, uh, the more people who think you're nuts and laugh at you, well, if they're wrong, that means the better price you're getting on your trade. Yeah. Agree with that. Uh, we got another comment here from Lark Ball. He's saying, don't forget to mention your Silver Fest. So can you give us some insight on your Silver Fest? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, actually, we wanted to have, uh, we were thinking about doing an in-person conference last year, just didn't quite get there yet. Um, and then especially wanted to do something this year. And, uh, you know, obviously focusing on silver and thinking about how, yeah, and I get the frustration that's been in the industry, although especially now it's great, the price is up a little bit, but even whatever the price is, just bringing something where that has a positive energy and celebration of this situation, I, I think it takes someone with some real strength and conviction, like yourself, Patrick, to stick through this, you know, it's... You know, sure, it's going to be easy to talk about silver when the price is 50 or 100 bucks, but, you know, to sit there when people are giving you crap about it, oh, well, I bought the silver, it's down. And But I think there's a lot to be said for the people who stand there and accountable and say, all right, I understand that, you know, and yeah. I understand sometimes it's not fun waiting. But so, I mean, we really have a special group of people whether it's the bullion dealers, the investors, the people who are out there watching now, the mining companies that I have a lot of respect for have had to run a business in some very non-ideal conditions where the price of the thing they sell is being manipulated. And I was just thinking about how it feels like we haven't really had like a celebration of a, a big party in the silver market since the Hunt Brothers. Yes. And September 12th and 13th is Silverfest. <coughs> Patrick, if I may make a special announcement on your show, just this very this very morning, uh, again, I'm quite fortunate to know a lot of these great silver investors, and there is a rumor that Patrick Vieira of Silver Bullion TV might be a guest at Silverfest September 12th to 13th, so that's the kind of hot party it's going to be. Um, <laughs> But I mean, getting the, the the people like you that day after day, week after week, month after month, keep doing that and sharing this information that is so valuable and um, I think represents more than just an investment. I think that's why people are so, it's not like Tesla sold a couple of extra cars or had a big quarter. Yeah. You know, it's the idea of sound money, of an honest government, of not of the, the libertarian ideals of free trade, respecting each other. Um, so we have a great event planned September 12th to 13th. It's free for the people who would like to attend. Um, I'm going to have a lot of Q&A, a lot of guests, uh, a lot of had fun making out the schedule. Um, one of the topics, uh, for example, is the next time silver hits $50, oh. does it go over $50? Um, how much silver was lost during the COVID shutdown? Is the COMEX going to fail? Um, the real story behind the Hunt Brothers, uh, another panel about why Warren Buffett. People say, well, if gold and silver were so great, how come Warren Buffett didn't get into it? Um, yeah. Aside from the fact that his father, Howard Buffett, was a well-known, staunch, sound money advocate, which makes Warren Buffett's uh, gold comments rather perplexing to me. Yeah. Um, in silver, I might add that Warren Buffett didn't once buy a large silver position, but on two occasions, first when LBJ demonetized silver, uh, I'm not sure how much he bought there, but keep in mind when uh, Warren Buffett was buying silver in the 90s, his position was larger than the Hunt Brothers. Yep, yep. And again, this is not conspiracy theory. You can look up uh, his 1998 shareholder meeting where he talks about why he bought silver. And the reasons are the exact same reasons that we're talking about now, except now they're even more extreme. Um, so this is all the stuff we're getting into and really just creating a two-day celebration where 
you know, you can get the information, but even more than that, have booths where you can interact with people, you can talk to the mining companies. Patrick, I'd like to get you set up if you're interested, of course, with a press booth sure. so people will be able to actually pop their video in and say, hey, Patrick, what do you think about this or that? And um, really just give something for to bring people together and connect them. And who knows, maybe we'll have an even bigger silver price by then, which personally with the upcoming September deliveries and silver looking like the mother load and yeah. the way we've seen gold and silver continue to accelerate, um, so I, I think it's going to be a really fun time for, for people. And uh, thanks for asking about that. <clears throat> sure. I, um, I'll have to finish reading your book first before, uh, before the Silver Fest so I can give everyone the right and correct answers. I'll, I'll... Oh, please. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, I, I should be reading your book so I know something about the market before I get there. <laughs> no. Hey, we got uh, one more, um, another question come in from uh, – Conrad, uh, again, he's asking about um, if you ever consider Joe Rogan or H3H3 or Yang podcast. It's funny. Uh, my business partner today was talking with someone who buys some silver from us uh, from time to time. And uh, they were talking about trying to do some campaign to get me onto Joe Rogan's show, which would certainly be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Um, especially now that the book's out, there's been a lot going on, but, uh, planning to, you know, contact a bunch of different shows and let them know what I've researched. And certainly, uh, you know, it's fun. Uh, I mean, I guess it's fun having the book and, you know, uh, I mean, you sell copies is nice and, uh, but I kind of, maybe this was partly the design. What's really exciting is like it's not just me it's a i'm part of something that is all the people watching that's you patrick that's your guest and all these people who care about this and want to see i don't and, and i don't my goal isn't to see jamie diamond in a prison cell or anything like i don't believe in that i just want I, I, it, it it's like it's sad to me that i think most people who just want to take care of their family, have a place to live and eat food. Yeah. I think today it's harder than before the industrial revolution. I'm in Denver and I go downtown now and I'm stunned when I see tent cities everywhere. Whoa. And this is Denver where everyone's supposedly moving to one of the better economies. And it's interesting because just imagine if the US wasn't lying about the unemployment number all this talk about, you know, this strong recovery. I mean, if you look at John Williams' shadow stats, where it's been above 20% since the 2008, you know, and there's a lot of people that life isn't so easy for right now. And partly it's because the Fed's inflated away over 99% of the dollar. Another half of that's being taxed away. So, I mean, no wonder it's hard for people. They're, they're, they're eating 99 plus percent of the pie. And in my last couple of years going to the trading floor, I'd walk through Occupy Wall Street each day. And I saw people were upset and frustrated. And it was almost like, cause it's the whole inflation thing. It's a sneaky way of doing it. You know, you tax people, they know it, but you inflate and print money. And you know, it's harder for people to see and for whatever reason, I was able to be fortunate enough to see this. Um, you know, that's, uh, and it's something that I think is quite, if there was one thing I could do on my time during this earth, you know, and everyone has their own calling, but seeing the amount of inflation and the way it affects so many lives, you know, and that it's that we actually maybe we're at that point where I know it's been going on for decades, probably hundreds of years. I mean, the Roman Empire did the same thing. But the fact that we have these tools like the Internet now where you can share information and people can go on and learn things. And I get and I know you have them, too. People who are new to silver, but are like, oh, this is all finally making sense. And that's how I felt when I got introduced to Austrian economics, where I mean, I've gone to business school, worked at. Moody's, 
they might add, still has U.S. debt rated <laughs> triple A, saying it's not possible to have a better credit profile. But I guess what gives me hope, and uh, we talked a little bit about uh, this morning or your last night, um, I think the, the possibility for a great other side of this I don't use this analogy lightly, so please take in the right context, but you imagine the, the way the unfortunate slave-slave master relationship, slaves were making all this stuff. They're going out getting all the food, and they wake up one day and say, wait a second, this bozo is just coming around slapping us and whipping us. We just throw him in the lake. Perhaps without the Fed and these banks, it would. it's like if we didn't have the mafia putting a gun to our head, taking... 99% of our income. I'm not saying there won't be an adjustment, but you know, when I drive downtown Denver, there's a lot of people who are struggling right now. So, you know, some people say, well, if you have 50 or hundred dollars silver, is that a world you're going to want to live in? We had $50 silver in 2011 and it didn't change a darn thing. I get it. The what's behind that, where it's like when this stuff unravels, but I wonder if the dollar the dollar is the one of the tools that was used so that the second George Bush could go kill people in Iraq when they not only weren't their weapons of mass destruction, evidence came out later that they knew darn well. They went in there and did that anyway. And I don't know how that's different than what Hitler or Stalin did. When you go in and kill people based on a lie and you, you convince people who have signed up for a military under... I think most cases a genuine honorable oath to protect their country and you take advantage of that. But that stuff only happens because you can print money. Yeah. And so the idea that, you know, a lot of this stuff is being exposed, not just in finance, but in many industries. And I am encouraged every day when I see people, whether it's doctors who are speaking up about the things they're seeing and, you know, or any area of life. You know, it's this, I think of government. I, I find at least, I'm not telling anybody else what to think, but at least for it to make sense in my mind, I imagine like what we saw in The Godfather, Goodfellas. And it's like, without that, I think there is a lot of, of incredible things that could happen on the other side of that. And I know it's a sensitive topic and that's not in any way to take it lightly or little, but I, I mean, I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm, Maybe I'm right or not, but that's my belief and what I hope for. And again, just feel to to share the truth and uh, let people decide for themselves. The, the medals thing is going to happen one way or another. It doesn't matter yeah. what I say or what anybody does. I mean, that's going to happen. And, uh, you know, but I think for all those people who wonder, you know, government this, you know, bullying that, tax IRS this, and feel powerless – you, there is something we can do. Yeah. And you don't have to do what I do or what Patrick does or what your neighbor does. Maybe it's just encouraging someone or, or you know, if someone says something, you know, maybe it's not nice rather than one upping them and slamming them harder. Just remembering we're in this together. So if exactly. your friend's a Democrat and you're a Republican, my personal impression is that, you know, these guys up top are just giggling or saying, wow, we got, I mean, they're both spending a lot of money, killing a lot of people, doing a lot of horrific stuff, and they get people fighting against each other rather than realizing, hey, we, we can be on the same team here. Let's all swing away at the government pinata together, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I hold out a lot of hope for uh, some really special positive things in the future. Amen. Government pinata. I gotta, I gotta keep that one in mind. Uh, but you, you kind of touched well, on this also. Patrick, yeah. Can I give you one other one? I, I'm sure. I think we're gonna have to get bumper stickers made. Excuse me if I don't get the wording correctly exact, but been toying with some idea like if you don't like government, buy silver. If you, it's buy silver is kind of like the equivalent of shorting the government. So it's like normally you see like some stock that looks like a Ponzi scheme, you would short it, which means sell it because you think it's going to go lower. Um, 
And I haven't figured out like a direct way that we can short the government. But if you think <laughs> these guys, if you watch Nancy Pelosi and Trump and Mitch McConnell and whoever else fight and bicker and you say, I would never invest in a company run by this type of leadership. Um, to me, you know, so we'll maybe by uh, Silverfest, we'll get some bumper stickers made. Uh, <laughs> government by silver. I like that. I think we may have to do it. Uh, <laughs> I like that government pinata. That that's going to stick with me also now. But Chris, what's your opinion on on the Fed and pretty much the decade of zero to low interest rates? When does the Fed raise rates, or can they even raise rates? Well, they, they already told you never. <laughs> never. Okay. Because when the Fed comes out and says we're going to keep interest rates at zero. Yeah. Until at least 2022. I mean, I will. I don't. I don't know that there are many guarantees in the financial markets, but that's one of them. The Fed, they can't raise interest rates. We saw why in 2018. We saw what happened. The Fed raised, uh, tried raising interest rates following yeah. 2004's low interest rate policy, and that popped the housing bubble. So you see this. And that's what the Austrian economists were so great at. Uh, and I'm actually reading The Theory of Money and Credit by von Mises right now, which I believe was like his prime masterpiece. Um, and explains why. And to simplify it for anyone who's wondering, let's say you can afford to, you want to buy a house and your budget, you can afford 4% interest, right? And then the Fed comes along and, you know, interest is 5%, so you're not buying it. And the Fed says, well, we're going to cut interest rates to zero. I'm like, oh, this is great. Yeah. You'll even buy a bigger house and save some money. You don't have to pay interest, which is great until they raise interest rates. Yeah. And then you see that exact same pattern, not just in the U.S., but it's kind of nice that you can look at what's happening in any economy at any point in the history of the globe. If they have financial markets on other planets, and interest rate policies, you're going to find the same thing there, too. And it's it's like having uh, like that great sports almanac from Back to the Future Part 2, <laughs> where if you look at what is happening with the distortion of the credit and interest rate policy, when you add credit, as Ben Bernanke said in his op-ed, well, it's going to be great. You have this virtuous circle. People are going to be out spending money, and corporate profits are going to look bigger. What he didn't mention was that when you do the opposite, you're going to get the opposite effect. And you've seen that. It's not an yeah. accident that the housing bubble collapsed the way it did. And it's not an accident that what happened in 2018 happened. Um, it was funny. I remember a couple of years ago, uh, as a congressman says to Powell, it's like you had mentioned, pre this maybe 2017, and he says, you mentioned previously with regards to normalization of the balance sheet that you were going to bring it back to two and a half to three trillion in the next three to four years. Yeah. And Powell says, yeah, that's correct. And, Excuse me? <laughs> and, and where did you say that before? That was never on uh, any CNBC headlines. Normalization, it was, it was 900 billion prior to Lehman. So when he says the new normal is two and a half to three trillion, in that one sentence, that was a $2 trillion Q, QE package because he just confirmed it's never going anywhere. And when they say it's going to happen in three to four years, that means it's never going to happen. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to brag here, but I wrote that down then and and I bring that up because it's the same thing where when Powell says, well, we're not going to raise interest rates for at least two years. That means they're never going to raise interest rates because the whole thing would. How, how's the Fed, how's the U.S. going to pay interest if they actually had interest rate? All these mortgages go bad. All these mm -hmm. is and everything is so levered. It's interesting. I don't. You saw what happened. They tried raising to two and a quarter, two and two and a half. Couldn't go. Yeah. So you would. That's why I felt so comfortable with gold and silver early on. I don't know, maybe it was a decade early, but it's past the point of no return. My guess is they'll just continue hyperinflating it, and at some point gold and silver will soar. Yeah. Or, you know, they 
you don't even really have the option to do the responsible. Maybe raising interest rates would be the honest thing, or at least what would be honest would be to say the money is spent. We can't pay it back. Yeah. We've looted the system. And at least acknowledge that to people. And that's what that's what an honorable person does. You know, stuff happens in life. But you say, all right, I'm in this position. This is what I can do if, uh, if you can't pay it back. But, you know, the Fed just lies. And uh, I mean, Jer Jeremy Powell, the audacity <laughs> to go on 60 Minutes and say the, the economy was fine until Corona. Well, then why were you lowering interest rates before you ever heard of Corona? Why was he doing trillions of dollars of repo swap lines to the banks since last September? So, again, I really like to, to be positive, and my goal isn't to criticize anyone else. I like to focus on taking care of me, but to the degree that, that the man went on there and lied and gave information that, in my opinion, was designed intentionally to mislead people into making decisions that they can take advantage of. So on that one i'm just going to call it like it is yeah i hear you i hear you completely agree with with, with what you're saying also i'm going to flip through some some questions here and you know we know that uh back then as we touched on also the fed pretty much put the punch bowl in front of wall street wall street partied on and then the fed tried to pull the wall street back of the punch bowl back they tried to taper down wall street had a tantrum and now what we're seeing with the bug is main street main street needs help they need some relief and so the Fed has sort of put the punch bowl in front of Main Street with PPP and, and other programs going on. And so, like I was saying, they could not pull the punch bowl back from Wall Street. Do you think there's any chance the Fed can pull that punch bowl back from Main Street? I don't think they can pull the punch bowl back from Main Street because I'd slightly disagree with you, if that, hey, Patrick. Sure. I don't think they gave the punch bowl to Main Street. Uh, again... The banks drank the whole thing, and there's like maybe, I don't know, like if you, like my dog slurps in his bowl for the last drip of water, maybe there you can scrape something out. This, this, these bailouts were not designed to help the people. I mean, look at how much money went to these banks and these, uh, I forget which industry it was that, uh, was it Kodak or something that Trump's oh. saying, hey, 800 bill, uh, million or, you know, this was not, and again, when you say the Fed did this and the banks did that, are the Fed, keep in mind, who owns the Fed? The banks. Yeah. And think about it, one of my favorite whoppers in the financial system these days is that when the Treasury wants to spend money they don't have, the Fed buys the bonds. Keep in mind, the Fed is owned by the banks. Now, what... What Washington considers a check and balance safety protocol is that, you know, it's, you know, seems like a conflict of interest if you're going directly between Treasury and Fed. So someone, uh, there has to be an intermediary agent, which is usually one of the banks. So for the Fed to sell crappy treasuries that the Fed prints money, which is the banks to buy, they still <laughs> extract another fee by paying the banks as a middleman in that. It's like, the largest game of three card Monty. And because, you know, as that movie, the big short was so great at pointing out, they make it seem complicated. I've heard, and I know you've probably gotten the same thing over the years where people think, well, if I ask then they're going to tell me I'm stupid and that's not an accident. And that way, I mean, you just, you know, it used to be billions. Now it's trillions and just hope nobody notices. And it's, I mean, even, uh, you know, people like you and I are maybe the ones watching this show who dig into the Fed. I mean, how much do we really know about what they're doing right now other than what they toss over to the, you know, the mainstream media? And, you know, fortunately, there are reporters like the Wall Street on Parade and others that yeah. dig in. But, I mean, we had that report of, we have Dr. Skidmore who heard reports of massive amounts of missing government money, which he set out to disprove. And I mean, anyone who's heard the guy talk, he sounds pretty darn credible. He's yeah. not, you know, uh, you know, like some guy who's out in the conspiracy zone. And I mean, he was asking simple questions like uh, you'd say to the Department of Defense, it's the yearly budget was 122 billion. Here's a 700 billion dollar transfer. What up with that? And, and their response was to remove the documents from the website 
and pass FASB 56, which says for the good of the country and national security, yeah, yeah. the government doesn't have to publish uh, any financial statements. I don't think that's good for the country or it doesn't make me feel secure. Yeah, I hear you. It's a good answer. Great answer. Um, mining stocks. You know, we, we hear a lot of people say it's a good time to go into mining stocks. So can I ask you, why is it a good time to buy the miners and what should investors look for as they assess mining companies? Well, if you think gold and silver are going up, then it could be a great time to buy mining stocks uh, because you can get leverage on the move if you pick some good companies. Uh, keep in mind that, as many people found out over the last couple of years, if gold and silver are going down, then it's going to be less ideal and you could conceivably lose more on average with the mining stocks. A simple way of looking at it, um, let's say uh, backtrack a little bit when silver was 15 bucks, which was close to the cost of production for many of the miners to get silver out of the ground. So if silver goes from $15 to $20, that's a 33% return, right? <clears throat> now, if you have a miner that has a $14 cost of production, that means they, and silver is 15 bucks, that means they're making a dollar per ounce. So when silver goes from 15 to 20 for the miner, they go from making $1 an ounce to $6 an ounce. So they're making 6x versus the 33% return <clears throat> that you would get just by buying the bullion on that same move. Yeah. So, you know, uh, if I am correct and we see silver prices above $50 and, you know, some of these guys have a cost of production, uh, you know, if they were making a dollar an ounce and now they're making $35 an yeah. ounce. Um, and I know some people like to trade things more, although one of the things I was thinking about is like, wow, if I just buy these shares and leave them there, then I'm an owner in a business that's going to be making a fortune. And again, uh, you know, it's like the question of, well, do you sell if it gets to 50 or that's a personal preference thing? Because to me, it's like at some point, the dollar goes the way of every other fiat currency in history. So, I mean, it's great if, uh, you know, I can have $50 instead of 20. But if the dollar is ultimately losing the majority of its value, um you know, having the silver or having the shares or, you know, if that's what's being, I mean, it, to me, one way or another, the value of gold and silver with all the other dynamics, you know, in a normal world where there weren't massive Fed balance sheets or $25 trillion debt loads or, you know, negative yielding junk bonds. Yeah, that's right. I said negative yielding junk bonds. Yes. We're in a world with negative yielding junk bonds. So you get a negative yield on something they call appropriately so junk because you don't even know if you're going to get repaid. <coughs> It's, it's a nice way to lock in. That's not even a risk-free loss, a guaranteed loss with extra risk to the downside. I mean, <laughs> I'll pass on that. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's, and I know it seems extreme. It's, you know, and listen to guys like Peter Schiff, who were talking about the housing bubble 2005, 2006. It was just as hard for people to grasp that back then. Uh, and I can understand that. Again, I just do the best I can to put what's happening now into a context that hopefully makes sense and people can have the right information to make the best decisions for themselves. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you uh, another, a few more questions, and I want to get into some of the, the quotes from, from your book, The Big Silver Short. But I understand you you have a petition going on Twitter regarding JP Morgan. Could you let us in on, on that? What the what's the petition about? Yeah, I post I'll post that one in the uh, chat room again, but basically just wrote up something where, you know, if you think Department of Justice labeling it a criminal enterprise, traders confessing, there's no mystery. Bart Chilton said what he said. I mean, to me, like, is it enough to say, like, these guys should not be allowed to play in that, not be involved in the market? Yeah. Want to go cheat your friends at cards or whatever? Hey, that's not my business. But this is something that, as we've talked about, is not unconnected from people sleeping in tents in growing numbers 
in one of what is supposed to be the more prosperous cities in the country. Yeah. And you're distorting things, you're inflating, you're inflating the, the currency supply, distorting markets, not just JP Morgan, but in this case, uh, yeah, I think there's enough there that, um, and I put together a petition that lays that out clearly. I'd actually suggest to people, if you read that and it resonates with you, a uh, nice little thing I found out, if you go on Twitter and do the at symbol and then CFTC, you can actually find several of the commissioners, so send it to them. Uh, you know, ask answers from your congressman. In fact, um, Ted Butler I have a lot of respect for because he would often write things and say, and he would put instructions like, hey, here's the email addresses, send this to the people, send this to these representatives who have sworn an oath to protect you from things like this, and they sit there and do nothing. I actually sent uh, that something to Bart Chilton in 2011, as well as the other commissioners. Chilton mentioned in the interview that the other commissioners started blocking emails of people who were sending evidence. So here's, uh, I think the CFTC's budget, I looked up a while ago, I believe it's $55 million, and now we find out from the Department of Justice and Bart there was a crime taking place, but rather than investigating, they were blocking evidence. And Bart in 2011 actually wrote back to me saying, yes, you can see the places where I've talked about it. I do believe there's illegal behavior, although it takes three out of five votes to pass anything, mm -hmm. which the way he phrased it was about as clearly as he could say, you know, these guys are politicized. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's get to uh, some quotes from, from your book. Um, Hang on, let me see if I can if I can find them. Okay, so from your book, The Big Silver Short, I'd like to read a quote and have you expand on this. The quote is, we hear reports that for every ounce of physical metal, there are as many as 500 paper claims on each ounce. Could you expand on that a bit? Yeah, that was something I had heard throughout the years. Uh, Bill Holter had mentioned it a couple of times. <clears throat> I don't know that there's one set way to calculate it. I mean, sure. you can look at, I don't know, it's like a billion dollars of silver trades almost on a daily basis, or a billion ounces trades on a daily basis when you look on the volume. There's only 900 million ounces mined in a normal year. So, I mean, you have just so much leverage. You know, you see the banks hammer on contracts they can't deliver. And so that was one of the questions I asked, again, in the book. It was, you know, 15 guys, Andrew McGuire, Ted Butler, David Morgan, uh, yeah. Greg Hemke, a lot of the guys you have on your show, Rick Rule. And I asked, not every single one, but a bunch of them, for every ounce of silver, how many people think they own that via some form of paper derivative? And I did not get an answer lower than 500 to 1. Wow. David Morgan, who I think is a well-qualified opinion on the silver market, um, is on my YouTube channel. If you type in David Morgan, 500 to 1, um, it's, his answer is great. You know how David's like kind of like, you know, he talks, you know, he's like not, not you know, all over the map. He's like, well, you know, it's uh, about 500 to 1, although, you know, it's really probably a lot bigger than that because if you add in the derivatives – you know, we don't really know how much it is. I've heard people say it's like, you know, when Deutsche Bank gets itself into trouble, it's like, I don't even know if Deutsche Bank's accountants can calculate their true derivatives. I mean, it's like some of these things are so massive. And um, so it's like you, you don't have exact numbers, unfortunately, but um, – a lot of people know how Jeffrey Christian invertedly admitted it that uh, one of those meetings back, I think, in 2010. I think he said 100 to 1 back then. Um, I personally think it's a bit bigger, and uh, yeah. certainly you can read about it plenty in the book. Or, you know, if you, for some reason you just want to, you don't have to even buy the book. You can, again, you can go and Google David Morgan 500 to 1 and see the video of him talking about it. So, uh, it's set up for the end of It's a Wonderful Life, and that's why, if it weren't for that, I don't know that I would have the view that I have on silver. Yeah. yeah. But seeing the way the mortgages collapsed and then studying markets, 
you put 500 to one leverage on anything, then you do that long enough and you push the price to you push that beach ball underwater, it's going to go pretty high. Yeah. yeah. And then you have the Fed tack on a hyperinflation campaign to guarantee it. I mean, Patrick, uh, if you want to talk to the owner of uh, Silver Bullion, I, my suggestion, like any bullion dealer, change your homepage. Just put Ben Bernanke, like a video of Bernanke on 60 <laughs> Minutes or Powell on 60 Minutes. They're the greatest gold and silver salesman ever. I mean, you listen to these guys talk and it's like, uh, I'm like, all right, I got to go buy some more <laughs> silver. I mean, they... And people aren't morons as much as government officials treat their constituents as such. And I think that's why, uh, and I'm sure you've seen this too, this this metal these last couple months, it's not just the gold and silver bugs. Yeah. yeah. People are freaked out, just saw what happened in the stock market, then they're reading line, uh, headlines of round two of Corona spiking and more stimulus packages last Last week, uh, Powell's saying, well, he's concerned about the outlook, uh, which means they're, they're, they're already doing unlimited quantitative easing, and they're thinking about a package to blow that out. Of, how do you blow out unlimited out of the water? But they'll try. They'll try. They, they will try. They will try. Uh, let me see. <clears throat> Another uh, quote from your book. I mean, after all, how are you supposed to feel upon realizing that the U.S. system of government and finance has become the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of the world? Why, why was the word Ponzi scheme used? Um, and I apologize. Fortunately, one of your Nemo flicks just... I realize I have my microphone sitting here and it was not plugged in. <laughs> okay. I hope... Hear me clearly is, is a little better right now. It, it's it's better, but I think we we could hear you. Um, we could hear you from before, so it's. I think okay. you're okay. My apologies on that. Hope it's a little better, folks. I do that from time to time, and then I'll listen <laughs> back. And uh, um, anyway, uh, that's the thing about that quote where you know it says 2009 and uh, things were progressing, and I started digging into this and. Mm -hmm it's 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 shocking and it's like what are you supposed to do and i get why a lot of people are scared and why you know people hear things and you know they think about the armageddon and stuff like that where it's you know and some of the things these governments and banks do uh it's you know uh it, it's hard to digest at times let alone some of the things that are being alleged uh, about some of these politicians now, which, you know, I guess we'll find out soon enough. Um, you know, and it took me a while. I went through my phase of all oh, these bastards and F this guy and that guy. And um, although at least for me, a big turning point in my life was a couple of years ago, especially when I started getting into metaphysics and meditation and reading a bunch of different things where you think about this pattern of how it usually goes with militaries. Well, you did this, so we're going to blow you up. And then after you blow them up, you know, whether it's the next day or maybe they sit there for the next 50 years, pooling all their resources and come up with some plan to one up them. And then they one up back. Um, and certainly I've had my times thinking in that style of manner. Uh, I like to think I've matured a little bit since then and, um, you know, I don't want to see someone torture this guy or beat the heck out of that guy. That doesn't, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, to be able to do some of these things or to harm people or, you know, to kill people and be okay with that. I imagine, you know, someone's gone through their own horrific trauma because I don't believe we're born like that. I don't believe that's natural. Um, and so that's why, uh, you know, I, I, I've tried focusing on the negative and focusing on the positive. One way works a lot better than the other. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's not what I would choose to do if somebody said, uh, in fact, it's funny. I've, 
I've I've dabbled at times of I don't know if I would say it was seriously, but putting together like what I would do if I were president. Hey. And it's actually it would be the easiest job ever because from an Austrian economics free market standpoint, really all you have to do is nothing. I mean, you go in there, just dissolve all these, you know, these agencies and goon squads like the CIA, which, um, by the way, there's a great book called The Nazis Next Door, which uh, details Operation Paperclip (laughs) and where all these guys came from and how the Dulles brothers said, give us your most evil, horrific Nazis that have killed the most. And as long as you're going to do what we say, you know, we'll tell people, well, we don't want the Russians to get them. And I mean... The book goes, not my opinion, evidence, data, documents. So, I mean, all of these, you know, uh, what's that uh, other goon squad? It's like the Merrill Lynch of government. Anytime something goes bad, they're always there. They're not The ATF, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh-huh, ATF, yeah. look, at what, look at their role in uh, that Waco thing sometime. But all of these... DEA, uh, you know, all these these agencies that say one thing, but then end up doing a lot of harm um, that people are paying for and getting ripped off by. Um, you know, the Federal Reserve, yeah, easy, just invoke the charter. What what? These yeah. guys are criminals. Yeah. But- read and don't take my word for it. Read Creature from Jekyll Island. Read how it was formed. Read the history of these banks funding both sides of the war just to make a profit. Read the history of the sinking of the Lusitania that convinced where Woodrow Wilson knew there was a ship that passengers were on. And the Germans warned and said, you know, you have weapons on there, too. We're going to sink the darn thing. Turn it around. But rather than warning, he just let it go anyway. Or read about General McCollum's uh, documented plan to antagonize the Japanese into attacking Pearl Harbor because the U.S. had no appetite for the war, but create, oh, well, he hit me back first. Gulf of Tonkin, September 11th. These are the things that the Fed finances, that these banks finance. This is horrific. Look at the Bush family's history and its involvement with Brown Brothers Harriman and the financing of the Nazis. These are not unconnected things. And I know if someone's hearing it for the first time, it may sound wild. And it is wild. And I can understand, frankly, if people think, what, what, what is this guy talking about? But that's why, again, you don't, anything I've said tonight, you don't have to take my opinion. Please double check, verify, see if you don't find the same things. Um, and, and I think that's when people wonder what can they do. I think it can be as simple as that, just learning and then, you know, you pass on, you know, and you don't have to jam thing down people's throats. Yeah. And there's some people that don't want to hear it and I let them be. But, you know, when they show up one day and say, Chris, you know, yeah, but I thought you were nuts when you first said it. But then I went and I read and I saw everything you said. You, you, it was actually documented and true. And I think that's the thing for the, I know it's like some people, the sheeple this and how these dumbasses don't get it. I get there and I've done that. Uh, but I mean, when you call someone stupid or you scare them, that's a guaranteed way to make sure they're not going to listen and actually hear the value of what you have to say. Yeah. So that's something that, you know, is what I aim for is just um, in whatever is a way, whenever someone's ready for it, um, you know, to be there to patiently explain, even if someone sat there and said, you're a conspiracy theorist for 10 years and then says, Hey, Chris, I realized you were right about this. Don't, or, you know, the point isn't to like, and I know there's the ego in us. Sometimes we're like, Oh no, screw you. But that's, that's what we can do. That's how we can make an impact. And it doesn't, have to be to thousands. You never know when that, you know, years ago, there are times where I've been really down in my life, but people encouraged me. And now, you know, I'm at the point where, you know, I'm fortunate to have a, an audience and be able to speak to people like you about this. Um, so I think in our, you'll all know it in your own way. And I mean, just being an honest, good person, uh, the more of us that do that and support each other, 
Um, I think it's a lot more of us than there are of them. And when we even coordinate and, and help each other and support each other and even a fraction, I don't know, maybe 3% is enough or 5%. You don't need everybody in the planet getting this, but it's, it's funny. It's like sometimes I think about how when I was little and I was pretty awkward, uncomfortable and uh, not, you know, fitting in well. And it's like I would see the movies where, you know, and always want to be the hero in the movie. And this is the there's the that way that in each of our own lives by just speaking up when it's appropriate to do so yeah. and supporting people when you can do that, um, I think goes a long way. Yeah, I hear you. I think um, it's also important for people to know that we're not necessarily more so than being anti this or anti that. It's really because we're we're pro we're pro people, and have a another comment for you from Michael B. Um, he's asking if you can get JFK Jr. on your show. <laughs> I don't know if I can. I will. Uh, I will. Well, tell you what, I actually do have him on my. Instagram feed, so <laughs> I will make a note to JFK Jr. Uh, certainly some interesting things he's been pointing out. Um, so, yeah, I will uh, look into that. That would be a fun talk. Uh, who, who's the favorite guest you've had on your show, Patrick? I'd be curious <laughs> to know that. Is the one that really stood out to you? My favorite guest is Gerald Salente. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he, <laughs> great. he's he's just going to tell you things straight, and um, I yeah. I appreciate him for that. Um, he can get a little bit worked up, a little bit heated, and um, I'll admit sometimes I'm in my mind I'm thinking, you know, Gerald, please calm down. I don't want anything to to happen on this on this interview, you know, <laughs> I don't want anything to go bad uh, with his health and stuff. But he's he's my favorite. He'll tell you what it is, and he's yeah. looks like he's trimmed down a bit. He's He's mellowed out a bit, but you're still going to get the, yeah. the truth from him for sure. A um, few more yeah. questions for you, Chris. I think I'm not sure if you got to get, get going on, but, um, you know, also I'm happy to be here as long as we have questions and I can be of help. So I'm here for whatever you need, my friend. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Also in your book, another quote, I also personally <clears throat> believe that life after the dollar actually has the potential to be an incredible blessing for all of the honest, hardworking people out there. What do you mean in that statement? And in your opinion, how are things going to look when the U.S. dollar is no longer what it is today? Well, we touched on it a yeah. little bit. And to uh, perhaps recap that, I, like, I have this uh, metaphor I like where, again, you know, you could measure just by the gold price as it is, as distorted as it is now, that since the Fed was invented to now, the dollar has lost, uh, I believe it's over 99% of its value. Then you get that other chunk being taxed away. But let's just say you're get everybody out there is getting 1% of what they actually contribute. So let's say that the banks, instead of eating 99 plus percent of the pie, Let's say they just cut back a touch to 90%. They were only inflating 90% of your, uh, I used the wrong word, that they were only stealing because that's what it is. This is, to be clear, this is, this is a theft. So if they only stole 90% of everything you earned, hmm. So maybe that uh, single mom that has a couple children, Feeling pretty anxious and scared a lot of the time, working two or three jobs, barely has any time to relax or even take care of the kids. Imagine if you if you went from 1% to 10%, let's say it's someone who's making $25,000 or $30,000 a year, really struggling and just to take care of their family. What if you added a zero onto that, which would be the, you know, if you're cutting back from 99% to 90%, so imagine if that that woman wakes up, now she's making two hundred fifty thousand dollars for doing the same thing. Maybe she wouldn't work yeah. two or three jobs to have more time to spend with her children. Wouldn't be as stressed and panicked. 
I wonder, uh, do you think, Patrick, do you think there would be an impact on the amount of crime out there if everybody had 10 times more? I mean, maybe there's yeah. some people, uh, we'll call them government, that no amount is, much, is enough and they're going to steal whatever they can. But aside from that, yeah. I mean, for the most part, you know, it's like you don't go and rob or commit a crime and risk going to jail or whatever other consequences or, you know, unless there's some like fear mindset of not enough, which. So, I mean, that's uh, let alone if you do more than 10 percent. <laughs> um. So again, I don't know what the transition will be like, although yeah. I will say I feel pretty confident that the more people that understood that last point, I mean, if everybody in the country got that and said, all right, anyone who's been doing this crap, you go there, here's an island, go hang out there. You guys can rip each other off, but let people yeah. who want to live, again, it's, it's like life is, it couldn't have been this hard before we had the industrial revolution and you have all these things think about this system we have anytime you have productivity the fed comes along and says no we're going to prevent that we can't have that we're going to uh, we talked about this morning the, the the fed bernanke has to be looking at that cell phone that, that was the size of a <laughs> cinder block that michael douglas is using in the movie wall street to them they're sitting they have to be saying oh my god it's 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 a smaller, more convenient, and a fraction of the price. That's it's like when we start out. Peter Schiff had that great uh, children's book he made, where it's like simplified everything, yeah. made it easy enough for a congressman to understand. Where it's like if you have an island with two people and they each spend their entire day catching a fish, they eat it, they go to sleep, they do the next thing, and so that's their entire life. But then one day, one guy builds a net. He's like, hey, I can catch both the fish. You take your time, you know, build us a roof, a little hut. That's productivity. That's what's supposed to happen. Prices are supposed to come down. That's not a bad thing. But in the feds, and to be honest, I don't really think that the uh, people running the fed believe that. I think there's a group of people that are on top of this, watching, stealing, giggling, having a keg stand w looking at people democrats fighting republicans and saying yeah. wow we got them all to believe this while we're picking their pocket and they don't even know that we're there and that's why uh, again you know i appreciate there are folks like you that give a platform so that people can understand this because i do think that's changing you have a lot of people waking up quickly and i'm not saying it's the entire planet but i mean you know, there's a lot of wacky stuff going on right now. Yeah. And can only lie to people's faces for so long until they start to see, you know, this doesn't make sense. And that's, uh, I guess, if there's anything that I can offer is perhaps just to put some things in context. Because I think there are, t and I get the comments, I know that you get them too, where people are like, yeah, thanks for saying that. I always thought this didn't make sense, but it's like, Everyone on Wall Street just said that's the way. Well, it's not the way. That's that's the way to lie. That's the way to deceive. That's the way to cheat. That's the way to steal. But the stuff actually is pretty darn simple. And um, there are people that are pointing it out and explaining it. And I would just, uh, if I may suggest anything to your audience, trust your gut. You know, yeah. don't do anything because I say it or Patrick says it, but see what makes sense to you. And usually if, if it seems bizarre that these same banks melt down the economy, cause these crashes and, and somehow this group called the fed is just like, well, we're going <laughs> to print up a fresh batch of hundreds and come by on. It's all good. I mean, it, I have this, the very complex, uh, sophisticated financial model rule that I've developed. Okay. It's actually not complex at all. If you say it out loud and it sounds asininely stupid, it probably is. So all this stuff that government says out loud. So when you see Donald Trump, and I'm not trying to take sides here, but when he says during the campaign, the stock market is a big fat bubble fueled yeah. by the Federal Reserve to support the Democrats. 
and then he becomes president and says he wants negative. I mean, it's it's almost that it's, it's, it's like begging like a crack joint. I need the negative interest rates. Give it to me, baby. I mean, it's yeah. So that's what uh, it's like. Then I don't know. I mean, it's not rocket science to say like part of there's a lie in there somewhere and. You know, I know there's some people who say he's out arresting the guys who've been doing a lot of horrific things and returning us to gold standard. I sure hope that's right. I don't know. All I know is that, you know, when someone lies about a lot of stuff, and I'm not just picking on Trump, they all do it. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe they're telling the truth here or there, but it, it's kind of hard to know when when a liar is, is being honest or not. And um, so. Yeah. You know, Chris, Someone else looking to to get the word out. Silver Gold TV. He um he says you inspired him so much that he decided to make his own channel, Silver Gold TV. Cool. Well, that sounds like a great channel. Uh, we have Silver Bullion TV and now <laughs> Silver Gold TV, and uh, actually a great name for a site from a keyword standpoint. So I that's uh, that's really encouraging to hear. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot more, and certainly for people who are concerned, and I know that I get the question a lot, you know, if I don't have money to buy silver, what, what yeah. should I do? Right. And I think what that uh, reader just wrote in is a great example where part of why I left the trading floor was I was sitting there thinking, is this, is there going to be people flipping options on the New York Stock Exchange in a couple of years when this goes down? Um, so I took my my best guess of how I saw things playing out and how can I design my life and what I like doing and what I have some knowledge or skill at into an area that's going to be in need. I think there's actually a lot to be said for that yeah. idea because especially now where, you know, the economy is changing, uh, I believe my thoughts on the lockdown aside, but to the degree that things are the way they are. Um, I don't know. Maybe we need as many restaurants as we have or we don't, and that's the economy's way of sorting it out. But in either case, you know, there are needs in the economy. And to the degree, if you're understanding and following the gold and silver stuff, you know, which, I mean, we've... Uh, it's interesting how Wall Street is backing away from the gold and silver market right as it's heating up which seemed a little odd to me. Maybe it's more related to their short positions. But I mean, once you have an industry heat up, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity in gold and silver. These prices, the mining companies are making a lot of money. Yeah. So the idea that someone is seeing what's happening, has an interest in this, and starts a gold and silver channel on YouTube, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I and do they're, they're, they're doing a service that is very much needed, and that there's going to be a growing interest in, and uh, and I I think that's the the perfect example of the kind of thing that someone can do, and uh, it, it 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 feels great to hear that. So yeah. I thank you uh, for the the person who did that and shared that comment. That's really nice to hear. Yeah, I totally. Maybe, and if yep. I may, one other suggestion: when you start your channel, see if you can get Patrick on. <laughs> I've been trying to get you on to my show, Patrick. I'm hoping soon, maybe we could do your kickoff debut appearance at Silverfest, <laughs> um, which would obviously boost ratings and attendance. Um, I, well, maybe I'll pressure you a little bit. I hope you'll be there. <laughs> but yes, I would suggest to that uh, wise fella, get, get people like Patrick on there, and there's going to be a lot of people that will come to your channel and I, I'll look forward to checking it out as too. If you want to send me a message when there's a link for that. Yeah, we'll, we'll do, we'll do it. We'll do uh, whatever we can, uh, we can do to help. Well, one more question because this one really stuck out in, in, uh, from your book, the big silver short or yeah, this one here, you, you were saying I was still under the Keynesian spell. I had been indoctrinated <laughs> with at Wharton and on wall street. <laughs> Can you can you touch on this? Well, I uh, again I mentioned my first job out of school was Moody's, which ironically, uh, if I can veer, uh, I'll get back to answer the question. Uh, was interesting. I was in this thing called an asset-backed commercial paper group, 
which wasn't entirely dissimilar from uh, Subprime or Enron, where they were doing off-balance sheet financing. Never really made any sense because, in hindsight, it turned out to be a scheme. Um, so my other uh, memory from Moody's was that everybody wanted to be on the eighth floor because that's where they were rating the CDOs. So oh. when I got into Wharton... Um, did you have a question there, Patrick? You... No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, so I got I was, you know, got accepted at Wharton, and I was thinking, all right, this is a great business school. Uh, um, you know, I'd go there, learn as the experts. You know, just shut up. You know, ask a couple questions, stay out of the way, and you can get a better job. And <clears throat> all the second year guys there were saying, well, if you want to get a job in the markets, I, don't know, I thought trading would be fun. So they say you got to take Jeremy Siegel's class. Uh, Patrick, are you familiar with Jeremy Siegel at all? No, no, no. no. His, his book is Stocks for the Long Run. And a uh, funny story, uh, there was after, actually one day we were in his office hours. I remember it was like me and maybe three or four other people. This was two, early 2004. And he actually told us he was being considered as one of the successors to Greenspan. Now, I, this was before I'd gotten into Austrian economics and was as clueless as could be. Um, so I didn't really quite grasp that. Although in hindsight, he would have fit in perfectly, perfect Keynesian mold. And, you know, I sat through his class where he said the same thing that we giggled at before, where it's like, oh, if the economy melts down, the Fed comes along, prints money, and it's kumbaya, Miller time. Um and I don't think that's an accident because, like, look at where the people that go and work for these banks come from. It's schools like Wharton and Harvard, where Greg Mankiw teaches that the real <laughs> problem is that we, this guy was saying back in 2009, he thought the problem was we're in all that debt. We still weren't getting people to spend enough. He was actually advocating, uh, this is a Harvard professor, advocating negative rates back then, which was as silly then as it is now. Um yeah. And as I found out later on, when you're on Wall Street and you're talking about gold and silver, that's not the way to uh, make a lot of friends there. And you don't become get promoted at Goldman Sachs uh, by talking about gold and silver. You get promoted by following the, 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 the BS. Yeah. Similar, it's interesting, you know, if somebody goes to Harvard Medical School and wants to become a doctor... You don't get your doctor license necessarily by finding, I mean, my, I'm not a doctor, but I certainly see in my later years a lot of natural stuff out there, and I wouldn't touch any of those uh, Pfizer bombs. But, you know, if you want to become a licensed doctor, you do so be, by answering the what their system says, you know, that you don't, and it's the same with the finance, it's the same with a lot of industries, um, and I think partly it's just the next step to condition people to think Keynesianism is the way. Um, I was fortunate. Uh, I guess the actual turning point was the day uh, in March 2009 when they uh, launched the second part of QE1. The guy who had actually I had clerked for when I was training as an option trader, someone I really respected. And I remember uh, him talking to another guy that I knew, and they were saying, oh, boy, here we go. As soon as the uh, loaf of bread is going to be $11. You know, it was very different from this Keynesian idea they sell us. But I remember there was that turning point where it was, this sounds extreme, and we've been encouraged to mock anything that sounds different from whatever is like the standardized way but I remember thinking, well, why don't I just at least hear why he's saying that? Yeah. And that was when he sent me a Peter Schiff video and instant. It was so there was so much of this system that never added up and made sense. Then he sends me that video and all of a sudden it just clicked. And perhaps I would encourage. Uh, I mean, it's I know people watching your show, Patrick, are already smart and get most of this stuff. But if there's anyone hearing this for the first time, I'd really encourage that same thing where, by all means, I can understand if, you know, if you're hearing this for the first time and it sounds like some of the things I'm saying just couldn't actually be the way this is set up. 
I appreciate that. I understand that. And I just encourage you to do the same thing. Go look for yourself. The resources are out there. You know, you can watch different episodes of your show, Patrick, hear yeah. one guest after another explain it. I think it's becoming easier to see as it becomes more obvious. And, um, you know, sometimes the emperor is really naked. <laughs> and I would suggest now is one of those times. Yeah, I hear you. Completely agree with that also. Um, so, Chris, Marcus, we appreciate you coming on. I think those are pretty much, pretty much most of the questions we wanted to ask. Um, if there's more viewer questions, we'll, we'll go ahead and ask. Uh, but one more thing kind of stuck out where, you know, you were on Wall Street at that time. And it seems like nobody on Wall Street saw what was happening. But yet we have the Peter Schiff's, we have the Dave Kranzler's. They seen it. Yep. They knew it was coming and they even knew to, to go into to gold and even silver. Why didn't Wall Street see that? Was it part of that indoctrination process that, that you spoke about? Yeah, primarily. I mean, you're encouraged not to see it. And, uh, you know, it's like, I mean, even after Peter Schiff got it right the last time, I mean, there are people who still, you know, give him crap now. And, um, you know, I don't know why it's it's uh, harder for people to look at Ben Bernanke saying subprime is contained. Uh, look at some of those quotes from Bernanke and Hank Paulson about mm. how it was fine and was going to be OK as it was melting down. Um you know, the Fed also told us, well, we're going to do quantitative easing. Everything's going to be OK. Jeremy Powell actually said on 60 Minutes that now isn't the time to repay the debt. Well, things are weak. But I thought Donald Trump and Powell told us the economy was great for the last yeah. 10 years. Yeah. How come they didn't repay it then? He's got, th they're lying to your face. They're hoping you don't pay attention or remember anything more than 10 seconds, which you know, often is unfortunately a successful strategy, but I would say just, I mean, these guys have never gotten anything right. Greenspan, I mean, this guy talked about a gold standard when he was hanging out with Ayn Rand. Now he criticizes Bernanke and it's great. You know, he's a gold bug, except for actually when he had the power to do anything about it. Um, there's a great, uh, Patrick, did you ever catch Bill Fleckenstein's book, Green Greenspan's Bubbles? Gotta say no, Chris. I, I, need to, I need to find other books besides my comics. I mean, if anybody <laughs> wants to check the Fed's credibility, read that one. I mean, it's, you know, 150, 200 pages of Greenspan uh, contradictions. And I mean, it, it's there for anyone to see. It's require all it requires is an open mind and being willing to forget about what you've been told by people who lie to you and cheat you and steal from you if you can let go of that for a second and just yeah. say oh, i'm gonna forget about that just what makes sense it's out there and patrick you're doing it on your show i'm doing it on my show yes, there's are. other people doing the stuff there and uh you know, maybe uh, one last example to leave people with. We saw two reports last week, one from Goldman Sachs, one from JP Morgan, two big boys in the league, both saying about how gold, there was no, they actually said there was no fundamentals to support gold's move. Maybe they uh, their feed to the Fed press conference last week didn't go through. <laughs> but at the same time, Goldman and JP Morgan, yeah. you know, probably the two most influential investment banks in the world, we're saying why you should sell your gold. Yeah. When we get the August delivery reports on Friday, guess who were two of the banks backing up the truck, taking delivery of metal? Yeah, yeah. yeah I hear so you. you got the track record there. This is what investment banks do. I think it's unfortunate, but to the degree that when you can read through it and see what's really going on, it gives people incredible power to take control back into their own hands. And I think now is certainly a time where if you have the courage to stand up, you don't even have to say anything to anybody else, but just to like forget about what other people are telling you should do and trust your gut and what feels right. I mean, I think there's a, an incredible time where there's a great benefit in doing so. Okay. <clears throat> Last question before we exit. Uh, from DJ, and it is a question about exiting. What is your exit strategy for precious metals? That's a great question. 
I guess it depends. If you think the, uh, I know, I mean, certainly I got clobbered on the way down in 2011, although I don't know, maybe if I had known everything I know now back then, I might've done something differently. Although I don't think I regret it at all because to me, at some point the, the dollar doesn't come back, which means the metals don't come back down. And to me, it's like, you know, I look at these things that have asset value that has held for thousands of years. I don't know that we're necessarily going to be using silver coinage as money. Uh, I don't think that we need to. Uh, I mean, especially one of the reasons I opt for silver over gold is that so much of it is consumed by industry. Yeah. I mean, that's why you know, there, there's actually an investment grade form more gold above ground in investment grade bars than silver now. So in the investment grade form, silver is more scarce than gold. Yeah. And, and I would say unless, I mean, it depends, you know, if you, uh, I don't know, if silver goes up to $50 and, you know, there's something you want to buy or maybe real estate crashes and it takes less ounces to buy a house or something, that's that's kind of how I look at it, where I'd, I'd say, um, but I mean, when silver goes to $50, I don't know that I can think of a scenario in which the Fed won't be continuing to print and probably printing even faster than they are now. Yeah. So I would say like when you find actual real assets or maybe you find other investments that you want to allocate it into, but if you're buying silver and gold because you see them melting down the currency... I mean, if I buy some silver for $20 and it goes up to $50 and I sell it, but then they keep printing and make a mockery out of the yeah. dollar and force the price to $1,000 per ounce, um, I'd rather have the ounce of silver and look at that as well. Again, you know, uh, it makes it tricky because we don't know. Uh, I don't know if an, I don't. I don't think when silver gets to 50, there's going to be a bunch of banks can knock it down to 15 bucks for the next decade. Um, yeah. I guess that's the downside risk and, um, you know, I'll be completely honest. I mean, there's anything is possible. Um, so I'll lay out as best as I can understand the risks and the profile and certainly, um, you know, uh, if you discuss it with your financial planner. Again, yeah. I, I can't give legal financial advice yeah. in this format cause I don't know everyone that's listening, but, you know, you can send, uh, if there's, tell the, send this, this video to your financial advisor, say at this timestamp, listen to what he's saying here and ask him his opinion and find out what makes sense for you, not for anybody else. Um, you know, and there's different ways to approach that. Some people are more traders than others. Um, but to me, the idea that you can keep, keep things simple and, I mean, unless you see some way that the U.S. is ever going to repay the debt, balance the yeah. budget, and the Fed is going to unprint the money, which I think is uh, flat out impossible. Um, I don't know that we're anywhere near the point where I'm planning to uh, go out and say, oh, I got to get rid of this metal. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think we're nearing something you can't return from. Uh, if I'm incorrect about that, then yeah, maybe the metals do come down, but... Um, in either case, we've, we've gone through why I feel the way that I do. And I would say to, uh, certainly you can listen and hear what I'm saying, but incorporate that and do talk with your family, talk with your financial planner, uh, keep watching Patrick's show and let the things be put in context and, um, do what generally any area of life I found. If you just, you know, close your eyes for a minute, you know, and, just see what feels right to you without the radio blaring or Kramer's mm. mad money screaming <laughs> at you. Uh, you know, you trust your gut, you're going to end up doing pretty well. And no matter what you do is my experience. Okay. And <clears throat> last, last comment from, from viewers here from Terry B. Not sure if you know him, Terry B. Um, he's asking if he could have a, a meetup with Denver Dave and maybe yourself as, as well. So is there a way he could contact you? Yeah, well, you're actually in luck. Um, <laughs> well, I can't guarantee Denver Dave. It's a little hard to get him out of his cave. 
although <laughs> I actually am leaving Denver at the end of August. We do have a meetup group here, uh, the uh, Austrian Economics Gold Silver Meetup Group, I believe it's called. Um, if anybody wants to email me through my site at chris at arcadeeconomics.com, I can direct you to that. Um, again, I'm only in Denver for one more month, although we we're mm. planning two happy hours. And probably this coming Thursday, we're going to go play a poker tournament down in Blackhawk. So, Patrick, if you want to come on over and play some poker, um, it could be some fun. So I'm planning to get a couple of meetup events. Um, and uh, let me see. I'll uh, see if I can pull up the link real quick before we wrap up here and paste it in there. But, yes, we do have a meetup group. And um, as I travel, I'm not picking a permanent home yet. Um, and, uh, you know, you can stay posted. I will be mentioning, uh, as I go different places, uh, that's one of the things I'm excited to do. I'll be back in the East coast in October is the plan at the moment. And, uh, in addition to, um, uh, hopefully getting some nice meetups going there as well. I'm also going to try and get on the Comex and snoop around and see what I can find <laughs> there. And if I can uh, meet some folks and maybe get even a little closer to what is happening beneath the surface. Um, by the way, I just pasted that link in there for anyone who's looking. Um, so, yes, we do have events. Again, come to Silverfest. Uh, there will be ways to interact with people there. Um and I uh, always try, I, I do eventually get to all the emails I get, which sometimes is a handful, but, um, you know, that's, I guess the whole point is to be there and uh, help people in whatever ways I can as much as possible. So um, anyway, there's the, going to be more events and uh, ways to discuss this stuff and have a good time doing it. Okay. So um, Chris. Marcus, Arcadia Economics, and the author of The Big Silver Short. Appreciate the time you gave. And um, if you could also maybe just send us those those links one more time through my email so I could put it up on the uh, the YouTube site as well. Um, thank you for coming on. I think um, you know, you gave a lot of people a lot of great information, and, and we appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's really been an honor and a pleasure getting to know you. Uh, Same. I really Same. have a great deal of respect, not even just for what you do, but your presence and your energy and the way you conduct yourself and providing, a, you know, a great forum for people to get some really valuable information at a really important time in the world, uh, which is much needed. So uh, it's been a real pleasure and an honor to be here and interact with your audience. And thank you so much for having me and uh, hope to do it again someday. Yeah, we hope to have you have you back on again as well. Um, so, guys, that that'll wrap up this this live stream. Um, there were a few other topics, but I think we've we've um, outside topics from 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 the book. So I think maybe we'll we'll get on those at, at another time. But um, Chris Marcus, we again we're glad you you came on, and um, definitely we, we got to do this again sometime. You take care of yourself, and um, we'll see you again. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Okay, that's it for this live stream. And as always, um, just prepare for what's coming ahead. Saddle up and silver up as well. And we'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. See you, Chris.